So we saw that Anton Arnaud and Baruch Spinoza are trying to, um, to defend Aristotelianism against the Cartesian threat. And uh, Arnaud does it in a very traditional way. Spinoza does it, does it in a unique, uh, idiosyncratic way, but, uh, but because it is so unique, it's, it's quite intriguing for people. Um, now, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz is then someone who's very similar to Spinoza in his way of, of constructing things. And he's also in correspondence with Arnaud. So Leibniz was a diplomat and he, uh, he worked uh, in diplomatic circles, traveling around Europe, uh, uh, you know, creating treaties and, and doing international deals between, between countries. And he was quite effective at that. But then on the side, he is just writing tons of philosophy. He's creating, he's, he's, uh, sorry about that. He's creating, uh, he's trying to create a logical system that's something like symbolic logic. I mean, that's his, his goal. He doesn't, he doesn't make too much progress on that, but he conceptualizes of a, symbolic logic, which only comes to fruition in the 20th century. So he's very much ahead of his time. And, and he also invents calculus independently of Isaac Newton. And so uh, the notation that we use when we study calculus today is the Leibniz notation. So it's his notation that survives. Newton is the one that really popularized calculus and showed you know, how effective it is in solving problems. But uh, Leibniz, his notation was far more elegant and, and, and that's the notation that we use. Um, so Leibniz is a, is a polymath. Uh, he studies lots of different areas and he's very proficient at, at many of them and, and does a lot of good work. And I should also mention, oh, right here, Discourse on Metaphysics. This is one of my favorite things about Leibniz is, is that he wrote this Discourse on Metaphysics and it's about uh, Cartesian metaphysics, but also Cartesian physics. And uh, De uh, Descartes is very concerned with explaining everything in mechanical terms. So that the human body, all the motions within the human body can be, can be explained without appeal to the soul. The soul is merely this thinking substance that sometimes has the ability to, with the pineal gland, you know, shifting back and forth can make the body do certain things by the act of the will. But the body has a, a like, uh, it's a quote unquote, a mind of its own, but it's really just the mechanical interactions within the body. And that's what I explained in that, uh, in that section on the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. What Leibniz, and, and, and then in the midst of that, Descartes starts to work out a kind of physics along the lines of what Isaac Newton will perfect by the end of the century here. And he makes some claims about physics, uh, about, you know, he sort of presents like some laws of physics which don't work out. You know, uh, Newton has to, has to fix things, uh, but, he, he, but Descartes starts the ball rolling, so to speak, and it, in presenting some laws of motion and Leibniz finds the error in uh, Cartesian physics. And in this uh, discourse on metaphysics, he demonstrates the error. And, and the error is that uh, in New Newtonian terms, and Leibniz doesn't have Newton to refer to, um, but what Leibniz discovers is that Descartes did not account for force 
and, it, and it's really Newton's understanding of force as mass times acceleration that makes Newtonian physics fall together. And that's what we mean when we say that uh, Newton discovered gravity. Right, you, you've heard, you probably heard people say that he's sitting under an apple tree and an apple falls on his head and he's like, oh, there's gravity. Like people didn't know that apples fell from trees before that. That's the, he, he didn't discover gravity, like the phenomena of gravity. Everybody knew that things fall to the earth. They just didn't know how to explain it. And, um, or, or their explanations were somewhat fanciful along Aristotelian lines. And, and their explanations of, of why and how things fell on earth and behaved on earth was very different from the way they explained how uh, the sun revolved around the earth and the, and the moon revolved around the earth and Mars revolved, revolved around earth. That's the Aristotelian stuff and they had really two separate realms what newton did was to was to provide an explanation of gravity that explained the falling apple explained a trajectory of a cannonball and explained the trajectory of mars around the sun okay so newton has a single explanation for all those things and the key thing is defining force as mass times acceleration. That's the big breakthrough for Newton. And, um, but Leibniz finds that uh, Cartesian physics does not account for force accurately. And he demonstrates that, that Cartesian physics is not accurate and that there's a problem here. Uh, so that's quite, I mean, even though he didn't solve the problem, he identified the problem very accurately. Now, his explanation, Leibniz's explanation, was that what Cartesian physics does not account for is that there are souls within everything, and the force that he's, he doesn't refer to it uh, as force, but, but these diversions of what is anticipated behavior in objects, even like a cannonball, is that there, is, there are souls within the cannonball. So um, Spinoza was taken to mean that like there's a soul in a tree and Leibniz agrees with that, but he agree, he thinks that there's souls even in a cannonball, even in a lump of metal, a lump of lead. Uh, there are souls within that lump of lead. Okay. Now, again, Leibniz is defending Aristotelianism, but Leibniz is a little more self-conscious that he is modifying Aristotelianism. And he's trying to, uh, he's trying to zhuzh up Aristotelianism in order to make it survive in the face of the growing empiricism that's taking over Europe. Uh, and of course, he does discover this mathematical problem in the physics of, of the Cartesians and has an Aristotelian explanation is that there's a formal cause in the cannonball that accounts for its actual observed motion, which is not accounted for the, in the equations of the Cartesians. And now we're talking about not only Descartes himself, but, but his students. And... Uh, uh, but notice, you know, that does fit with Aristotelianism. It does fit with Aristotle. A cannonball has a material cause, the matter out of which the cannonball is made in this Aristotelian way. And then it has a formal cause, the, the formation of the matter into molecules of lead. And then it's shaped as a ball 
you know, these are all the formal causations. And what Leibniz says, and he thinks that the physics proves, is that you also have to say that the cannonball has an entelechy within it. So that entelechy is not something limited to organic biological physical objects, but entelechy is part and parcel of every physical object. So that's his that's his twist, and, and in some ways, he's only making explicit what many Aristotelians already believe. So it's a very enticing way of looking at the world for Aristotelians, especially as Aristotelians are fe feeling threatened by, by Cartesianism and other forms of empiricism. Okay. Uh, all right, so I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll cut that off uh, there and then talk about the motorology.